welcome to Beautiful Life. Hi, I'm Kathy Bixel. On today's broadcast, we are going to continue our message for 2016 to you on how to prepare your heart for a fresh start. If you remember, we ended our last broadcast reading to you a portion of scripture out of Isaiah 55 about how important it is for us to have God's thoughts for our lives. I hope that if you did not see the prior broadcast, you do have an opportunity to uh, listen to it or view it uh, on, in our archive section on our website so that you can be caught up to where we are and hear the first part of what the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear. But I want to read again to you that portion of scripture in Isaiah 55 because it's good. This is what the Lord said to the prophet Isaiah or through the prophet Isaiah to the people. And sometimes uh, it's, it's important to understand how uh, the backdrop for some of these prophecies in the Bible. The people uh, in Isaiah's day had just uh, experienced uh, a great amount of disappointment, uh, to say the least. They were in, in a place where it was very difficult for them to see that they had any hope for their future. But because God's heart is so filled with love and uh, intention for our restoration, no matter what disappointment or uh, despondency or uh, discouragement that we may be experiencing, even over some goals that we had for 2015, and here it is 2016, and we're still not anywhere near having achieved those goals, uh, whether personal or uh, involved with your work life or career or, or even spiritual goals, and that's more of or less what we're uh, focusing on in our broadcast. It's important to know that God always has a word of encouragement for us where we are. So in this portion of scripture, he writes, my intentions are not always yours, and I do not go about things as you do. My thoughts and my ways are above and beyond you, just as heaven is far from your reach here on earth. For as rain and snow can't go back once they've fallen, but soak into the ground. And that's an important uh, verse for you to hear today. Even as the rain and snow go back and uh, can't go back once they've fallen, but soak into the ground, providing seed to the farmer and bread for the hungry. So it is, God is saying, when I declare something, my word will go out and return and not return to me empty, but it will do what I wanted. It will accomplish what I determined. Now, the prophet Isaiah is saying here that you don't understand my ways and you don't know my intentions. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The advantage that we have as New Testament, New Covenant believers is we have the advantage of the scriptures that I read in the last broadcast out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul tells us that we can know the thoughts and the intentions of God's heart because we have the Holy Spirit as sons and daughters of God. We are now temples of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God who knows all the thoughts of God now lives in us and he wants us to hear with our spiritual ears the promises and the plans that God has so that we can have expectation and hope for our future. Jesus uh, himself taught us how important it was in the parable of the sower, which is found in Mark chapter 4 that you can study in your own time. I'm not going to turn there and, and talk about that portion of scripture because we will be here till 2017 because there's so much in there. But he talks about the four types of soil uh, to, uh, to use metaphorically to describe the human heart and how having the optimum soil of our heart or the optimum condition of our heart can determine the amount of revelation and understanding that we can receive from God. In other words, we may try to, for lack of a better word, drum up faith or try to believe something, but if our heart is, is hardened, or our heart is, uh, as Jesus described, the four types of ground, hard ground, he called them um, a hard soil, rocky soil, uh, thorny soil, and then also a fourth type of soil, which was fruitful soil. Jesus said the optimum soil is soft, 
a softened, cultivated ground that can receive the seed, right? Making the uh, analogy of, of a farmer sowing seed into the natural ground, that our hearts, if they are cultivated in the right way, they can receive the seed and it will grow. And what God said will come to pass in your life. That's, that's his intention. You know, it's possible as a, a Christian to have a hard heart. Will you say, how can I have a hard heart? Well, Jesus actually two times in the scriptures addressed his disciples about the hardness of their heart. One of the first times was in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus had just multiplied the loaves and the fishes and fed 4,000 people. And the next day, the uh, disciples are on a journey and realize that when they left, they forgot their bread. And they go into a panic because they forgot their bread. They had already, <laughs> they had already seen Jesus multiply sardines and rolls for uh, 4,000 people, but yet they were concerned of whether they were going to have bread, you know, on their journey. And Jesus said, "Did you, have you already, you know, I'm paraphrasing, your hearts are so hard, the, the impact of that miracle hasn't even gone deep enough clearly because, you know, they were fearful. And then the second, uh, the second time is in Mark chapter 16, where Jesus has appeared to his disciples after the resurrection and they don't believe him. And Jesus actually uses sterner language and rebukes them for the hardness of their hearts. Uh, the great uh, revivalist Charles Finney said that hardness, a hard heart, is a heart that cannot receive truth. And so we want to start the year off having hearts, you know, that are ready to receive what God has said. I will be right back and we'll go deeper into this message on how God wants to cultivate that, the ground of your heart to receive his promises. Throughout time, God has always reserved for himself a remnant, a people fully sold out to his message and willing to pay the price of radical discipleship. While the church and the world lie in crises, a message is sounding once again throughout the corridors of time that God can alter the course of history through a radical few. Consider Moses, the Apostle Paul, Daniel, Noah, Abraham and Peter, just to name a few sold out radicals to God's calling. Don't settle for the confines of the ordinary when the Father has set his love on you to be extraordinary. Rise up out of the ashes of loss and disappointment and take hold of the one who makes all things new. Join us on an adventure of faith to experience Christianity the way it is supposed to be. Radical, the Radical Rising Remnant. The latest book from Kathy Bixel. Get your copy now at kathybixel.com. Remember, the, the condition of your heart, the soil of your heart, has everything to do with your capacity to receive God's promises. Now remember, in our uh, analogy here that we're doing of, of the seed being the word of God, God's promises, what he is, his intentions are for your life, and your, your heart being the ground, the capacity of, your so of the soil of your heart to receive is so vitally important. And that is why Jesus taught on the parable of the sower. Our hearts can be so cluttered in ways many times that we are not even aware of. They can be cluttered, uh, Jesus called uh, one ground, the thorny ground, thorny soil, the cares of this life, the lust for other things, uh, the, our preoccupation oftentimes with taking care of our out outer bodies uh, causes us to neglect what's really going on on the inside of us. The Bible says that out of the heart flow the issues of life. So if we want an ultimate harvest in our lives in a particular area, our soil has to be cultivated to receive that word. So for example, if God has given you a, a promise this year of, um, of restoration, let's say something very practical in your finances, but 
you have a lot of cares. You, you, you are not yet founded in, in God's word, the revelation from God's word, that it is his pleasure to give you the kingdom, the kingdom that he is your heavenly father and that all of your needs are supplied through your relationship with Jesus Christ, the riches that are in the glory of God that are already set aside, that Jesus said not to even take thought for tomorrow uh, because the hev your heavenly father knows that you need clothes, that you need food, that you need all those practical things. There could be uh, cares in there that are like weeds. Um, the anxiety and the worry form weeds and you read a scripture and it just gets stuck in the weeds, <laughs> the weeds of all your cares and your preoccupations and it doesn't take root and produce a harvest. Uh, it was very interesting to me how uh, even as I was preparing to bring this word uh, to our viewers, that the Holy Spirit began to really deal with me about an area in my life where I was not, uh, my, my ground wasn't as cultivated as it should be. As the Holy Spirit often does, he spoke to me in a dream actually last night uh, about this uh, about this very message and how and how it applies to me and in the dream the first part of the dream was wonderful it was the fulfillment of of something uh, that is uh, how do I want to say this to you uh, I don't want to say an issue in my life but that might be the best word but there's this one area in in my life that I have um, some challenges having hope for, okay? I, I think that maybe those of you listening uh, and viewing can relate. Uh, an area that it's just a little harder sometimes for me to get, m get myself in line with what God says. And so it's just a, often a challenge. And I, and I often think that it, it's an area that sometimes I, I'm ambivalent in. I, I, I'm not so sure that things are as I think that they are, et cetera. And in this dream, there was this amazing peace and fulfillment around this area. A tremendous blessing and, uh, and um, encounter happened in this dream that was a fulfillment and actually God giving me positive information about this situation. And I was so happy in the dream, but I was also shocked in the dream that it turned out in such a good way. Well, then the next part of the dream, I go from this amazing experience to this next part of this dream in the old house that my husband and I used to have um, in our old house and I have a broom in my hand and there are these tiny mice with these pieces of bread and things like that all over the kitchen and I am chasing down these tiny mice with the broom trying to sweep them out of the house um, and they were like these miniature mice and I woke up thinking, oh my gosh, that was such a great dream until those, those mice <laughs> entered the picture. And then as I, um, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and also uh, to uh, show me through some dream symbolism that, that mice, are, uh, mice are symbolic of negativity, that they are, they're, they're negative little creatures that are hidden, but yet they, they try to steal little portions of things that they can eat. And, uh, and actually, one uh, book that I looked at said that mice in a dream can all, all, often sim uh, symbolize negative thinking patterns or a negative thought pattern that empowers uh, negative spiritual forces in your life. So in other words, how I think about a situation is what will empower the enemy in my life to empower him to uh, discourage me because it's what I am thinking about. And so even though I had a great first part of the dream that was filled with fulfillment, fulfillment and joy, the Holy Spirit was ministering to my heart about me taking the initiative and revealing to me that I have some pesky critters there that can, in, that can impact uh, the future manifestation of what God wants to do in my life and my future around this situation. And so, so many times we think that it's the, uh, the, the, the big things, but the Bible says that it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little foxes that get in, you know, get in the vineyard and, and chomp away at the grapes and before you know it, there's no, no harvest. 
You know, th we think sometimes it's the big episode in our lives or it's the big thing that happens. It's like we think it's going to take, it, it's King Kong coming and grabbing the vine and pulling it out of the ground. It's not the big thing. It's the little thing. And so I am so happy that I have a, a relationship with the Holy Spirit and was joyful that God loves me enough to say, Kathy, I have something better for you, but you're going to have to get the broom out. And I believe the Holy Spirit is saying the same thing to all of us today. What, what kind of behaviors in your thought and, and thought patterns have you uh, what it hosted in your house in 2015 that are keeping you from receiving fulfillment of the great future that God has for you? I guarantee I'm not the only one who has to get out of broom. So when we come back, I'm going to share with you how the prescription the Word of God has for us on how we get that ground cultivated. In this three-part audio series, you will find scripture meditations for divine life, health, and wealth. As the scriptures are brought to life with the accompaniment of instrumental sounds, you will be encouraged by the power of God's spoken word. Meditations for divine life will set you free from that old life of sin, fear, addictions, and depression, releasing you into a life filled with righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Meditations for Divine Health gives you a daily dose of God's medicine and fills you in on all your benefits. Meditations for Divine Wealth edifies you to be like the Patriarch Isaac, who while meditating looked up and saw his camels coming, which was God's provision. This set will elevate your faith to the forefront in calling these areas in your life as though they are. Visit KathyBixel.com to purchase your choice of either a CD or an MP3 download. That's K-A-T-H-Y-B-I-C-H-S-E-L.com. KathyBixel.com. In the Bible, when God speaks to his people about the condition of their hearts, he as always has a remedy and a plan. In the Word of God, that plan is always around plowing up how we get ground to be uh, receptive to seed is by plowing it up. Once again, uh, the Lord using metaphors from the agricultural life of the Jewish people to communicate to them ways, uh, so, or, or I should say communicate to them spiritual truths about their relationship with him to have their hearts ready to receive the word of God, they would need to plow their hearts, cultivate, turn over that soil so that it was ready to receive his promises. So let's look here at Jeremiah. We're going to look at two scriptures, uh, in the, in the, one in the book of Jeremiah and one in the book of Hosea that are two, uh, two times that, uh, that are referenced in the Old Testament where God tells his people to plow up their hearts, to plow up the ground. In Jeremiah chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 1, he writes to them, return to me. And then in verse 3, he says, break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise your hearts. In Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, he writes, uh, the, the prophet Hosea writes the word of the Lord to the people in, that, in his day, sow righteousness for yourselves reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. So the Holy Spirit is telling us that the way to get your heart ready for the, the seed, the promise of God concerning your life is to plow up the ground of your heart. Now, in that first portion of scripture, in Jeremiah, and if we don't get to all of this today uh, on this broadcast, we're going to do a, 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 another broadcast so that we can finish, you know, finish it up because I want to make sure that you get the power of what the Holy Spirit is saying and what it means to plow up your ground. 2016, as we start the year to get a, a, a prepared heart for a fresh start, we need to get out our plow. We need to start to plow our heart. 
in Jeremiah's day, uh, Jeremiah was a prophet who, whose ministry uh, straddled both that of King Josiah, the young king who, uh, who was made king at a very young age, who was a tremendous revivalist and, uh, and reformer. When you study uh, the life and the reign of King Josiah in the Bible, it is filled with the wonderful consequences of a king who followed the Lord with all his heart and instituted radical, dramatic uh, reformative change in, in his kingdom. But also at the end of his kingdom, there was another king, uh, which was one of his sons that actually was brought into power, Jehoahaz, who was not supposed to be in power, but the people liked him. And he was a son of Josiah, but he did not follow the Lord in the way that his father, King Josiah, did. Now, what happened is Jeremiah was was prophesying and ministering through the reigns of both these kings. And he starts the first four chapters of his book are talking about how the people had gone away from Josiah's reforms, how when his son uh, took over the, the kingship or reigning in, in the land, that the, the people reverted back to their old practices, um, their old sinful ways. Now, and to give you a, a little bit more history about this, Josiah was king and he had collected tax, he was collecting taxes and he decided that that tax money should be used to renovate the temple. And so he sent the priest Hilkiah down to uh, Jerusalem, sent him down there to start uh, renovations. And in the process of renovating the temple, they found the book of the law they found in their day what would be the Bible. They found the Torah. They found the Word of God, and which apparently is interesting to me had that, that they had not had the Word of God. But this was a great thing and brought so much excitement that uh, Josiah had everyone come to Jerusalem to hear the Word of God. Uh, and most commentators say that it was actually the book of Deuteronomy that Josiah stood up and read the entire book of Deuteronomy. And in that reading of Deuteronomy, the people discovered that they had gone astray from the Lord, that they had set up um, all these idols throughout the land, that they had worshipped all of uh, the gods of Baal, the sun gods. They had temples and monuments all through the land. And so the people repented. They had a change. They, had, they changed their mind. And they said to Josiah, we will abandon our old ways. And Josiah led the reforms of tearing down all these Ashtoreth poles, all these, uh, these uh, monuments that, uh, that were used in the worship and uh, sacrifices to the gods of Baal that were the pagan gods. And there was great rejoicing and blessing in the land when they did this. But by the time his son comes to, comes to reign, things had completely changed and the people had reverted back to their old ways of worshiping Baal. And the lesson in this story that, that Jeremiah picks up on by the time you, you get to Jeremiah chapter 4 and the rest of his book is admonishing the people and prophesying to them about what the consequences of this abandonment of Jehovah is going to mean for their life, their land, their prosperity. And uh, he, he is prophesying to them about how they can change. Because what happened was they... Under Josiah, they made outward reforms, but they never changed their hearts. There was something going on in their hearts where they still felt that Baal could meet their needs. The God of Baal, the pagan God, the sun God, could meet their needs more than God, Jehovah, could meet their needs that God would not keep his covenant, that they had impatience about their prosperity. So pretty soon after the, the temples and everything and the, and the uh, altars were torn down, they were built up. And the, the, the lesson in that is that outward reformation and fixing up of the outside of you and even doing religious things 
if it is not an outflow of what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart is really an exercise in futility. You can feed the poor, you can uh, give all your money away, you know, all those things, but if you have not love, then it's, it's, a clanging, it's a clanging symbol. In other words, if it's not something that emanates from a true transformed heart, it will not manifest real change and harvest in your life. So as we go to our next broadcast, I want you to join us again because we're going to go into the next level of understanding of what plowed ground looks like because the Holy Spirit has great revelation from the word for us today so that we can move on to bringing a great harvest for God's glory. God bless you and we'll see you next time on Beautiful Life. We trust you enjoyed this episode of Beautiful Life and the teaching ministry of Kathy Dixon. For more information about Kathy, her books, downloads, and CDs, please visit BeautifulLifeTV.com. If you are interested in Kathy's teaching schedule, or perhaps you would like her to speak at a church or event near you, please email info at BeautifulLifeTV.com. We would like to thank you for taking the time to join us as we trust that God's blessing will continue to offer you His beautiful life. So long for now.